Hello, this is Paul Check. Welcome back to my video blog. Today we continue our series on the seven A's of healing. In the last presentation, which is part one, we went over acceptance. Today we go into number two, awareness. Very, very important uh, A, the second A. First, you have to accept the need to heal in order to do the work necessary to heal, which is outlined in the successive A's. Awareness is very, very important because without awareness, you're unaware or unconscious. You could say that awareness is equivalent to being conscious of something. If you're unaware of it, you're unconscious of it. Oftentimes, the things that we're not aware of are things that we have repressed or are suppressing, stuffing down so we don't have to deal with them, and that can become a habit and get to the point where you don't even realize you're doing it, but that does not by any means mean that those issues are not affecting you physically, emotionally, and mentally. Quite the contrary, generally we stuff down the things that have the most pain or fear attached to them, which means they're the most charged, which means that they have strong associations with everything in our environment that was involved in that experience. And those repressed experiences and their associations begin to link up with everything and everyone in our environment. And they become what is called in Jungian psychology a complex, a set of charged emotionally charged associations that can literally develop an artificial intelligence, even a personality all their own. Examples are you might find that you behave in unique ways when in the presence of your mother and or father, or even your brothers and sisters, but you behave in very different ways around certain friends or your lover or your boss. And what that's telling you is that there is neural networks regulating the persona, the expression of yourself, the mask that you wear based on whatever you have a conscious or unconscious fear of in that environment or with that person. And unfortunately, a lot of these uh, complexes develop in our first 14 years of life while we are under the submission of our parental influences, teachers, caregivers, and social influences of a variety of, a variety of types. So healing, particularly for those who have not developed their own ego yet, their sense of individuality, their willingness to say yes to the things that are congruent with their own dream, and no to the things that others want or expect of them is an issue because until we have developed our own ego, we often have all sorts of repressed thoughts, feelings, emotions, resents, angers, judgments, biases towards people. And we have a little story going on about why our problems come from that person or if I only had more of this, I'd do better, but they took it from me. Or if I wasn't abused by that person, I'd be okay now. Those are all basically giving our power away to somebody else. And those are all opportunities to heal the survival archetypes that Carolyn Mice teaches so well. The victim, the person that feels victimized, the saboteur, someone who feels sabotaged by others or is sabotaging themselves. The eternal child, someone who continues to act as a child and be dependent upon others for their safety, security, and sense of self-worth. And the prostitute, someone who keeps working for money and convincing themselves that they can't do what they love to do for whatever reason. I'll never make it or whatever story is being told there. And we'll talk about some of these things in a minute. So with that preamble, let's look at the word awareness. Awareness, if you put a dash between A and awareness, means a awareness, a sense of where am I now? When you're in deep dreamless sleep, 
You're nowhere and you're everywhere. You don't even know you're alive. Oftentimes you're driving down the car, down the road in your car, and you might be listening to an audio program or a radio program or something like that, and all of a sudden realized you missed the last couple of minutes. Or you go through an intersection and you can't remember whether the light was green or not. And you think, oh my God, that's an example of not being aware, of being somewhere else while you're doing something else, which is usually a great way to get injured or to make mistakes that later end up adding stress to your life. So awareness has a meaning of being aware of where you are and what you're doing. And in the various spiritual development paths, there's many, many ways of developing awareness that are taught. For example, uh, going to a fire walk. Uh, I did Tony Robbins' fire walk. I've mentioned that before. When you do a fire walk, you have to be completely and utterly aware or you will get burned. If you lose your sense of awareness for even one second, when you're walking on 2600 degree coals, you will shift your energetic state and expose yourself to the heat of those coals. If you're not aware of where you're at and what you're doing when you're running a power saw, you will potentially lose a finger. And I've seen that happen plenty of times in my career as a therapist. I could go through a long laundry list of these things but awareness means a where where am i and what's happening and the first place that we need to be aware that we're at is in our body and you'd be amazed at how many people that end up with some kind of legitimate crisis that needs healing whether it be a disease or a relationship catastrophe or a financial catastrophe are not present within themselves sometimes this is due to trauma that's not healed yet and when people are facing real threatening uh, traumatic situations such as an alcoholic or an abusive parent or physically violent uh, situation particularly when you're too young to know how to handle it the soul or the consciousness can literally jump out of the body and without what native american indian healers call soul recovery or energy healers call soul recovery that part of us actually becomes inaccessible to our conscious mind until we've done integration work and healing. So there are real times when we have to go get professional help to help us put our consciousness back in, which requires that we come face to face with the event in a safe or sacred environment where we can feel safe to engage our explicit memory our memory of the events or our implicit memory oftentimes we don't have an explicit memory we don't know what happened we just feel that something's wrong and we know something happened at a deep level so we have to work with our emotions and our body's messages which is implicit memory now if we look at aware and put a dot or a dash between where and ness uh, ness suggest a verb um, readiness cleanliness um, being um, timeliness those are all things that you do so a is alertment ah i awaken where i'm here ness i'm paying attention awareness so those are the things that were really talking about to begin our short journey of awareness today. Now, this goes very deep in Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 2. You, you get in you know five days of intensive training where we go much, much deeper in assessing many, many of the issues. But if you look, for example, at my book, The Last Four Doctors You'll Ever Need, How to Get Healthy Now, the multimedia ebook has videos, slideshows, and audio tracks. I teach you how to reestablish a normal breathing pattern. I teach you how to use work in techniques, and I teach you how to use sound instruments like tuning forks or Tibetan bowls, which can have a very powerful healing effect on you because those pure frequencies resonate with the chakras and can bring 
chaotic energy into harmony within your body and your mind and emotions. So a good awareness tool is to study that nice little multimedia ebook. How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy has a series of questionnaires that give you feedback as to the level of stress in key body systems. And when you score moderate or high, it suggests what chapter to, to read to bring your score down to know what practices to use and what awarenesses you need. And it also gives you zone exercises, which are very similar to Tai Chi or Qi Gong. And those help bring you into breathing, movement, and conscious awareness of the energies flowing through you so you can learn what it feels like when they move properly, but you can also begin to feel where you're stuck and start focusing on healing that. So today when it comes to awareness, I want to just look at a very simple model that I teach at the lower levels of check training, which is the foundation, very bedrock of my whole uh, living philosophy. When we're in a process of healing and we're going to apply the seven A's and we're going to look at awareness, the first thing we have to do in my one, two, three, four system is get clear on what you love enough to heal for. If we don't have a sense of direction, then we don't really have any motivation or inspiration to do the things we need to do, make the changes we need to make. As the old saying goes, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So identifying what is it that I love enough to set as a dream, goal, or objective? And what do I love enough that my willingness meter is at least a seven out of 10 so that I have enough commitment to really participate in my own healing? If you don't know what you love enough, then I always suggest people identify what is their nightmare or the one thing in their life, if they dealt with it honestly and addressed it, would free up the most energy and potentially the most resources so that you could begin to get more clear on what your dream is or what your love is and decrease the stress enough that you're not in pure survival mode so that your creativity begins to flower naturally and your natural problem solving abilities and your openness and willingness to engage other wise people that have made that particular journey already is more likely to come online. So first be aware of what you're doing and where you're at and good simple practices are a great, uh, just take any of the courses on mindfulness by people like John Kabat-Zinn, learn to be aware of your food, as you're eating it, smells, the feel of your body, spend time stretching and mobilizing your body and paying attention to where you have soreness or tightness or joint restriction. If you look at my book, How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy, there's a chart, a diagram that shows you the correlations between each of the energy centers, zones or chakras, and what are the psychological associations to challenges in those areas. So you can see what the body's suggesting that you pay attention to. So once we have defined our dream, our love, our goal, or our nightmare, then we need to look at where are we out of balance with the two basic forces that create everything. Yin, the feminine, inward going, energy multiplying. Yang, outward going, energy dividing. So the two forces then are categorized in the four doctors. Dr. Happiness and Dr. Movement are yang. They're usually ways we express ourselves. People, for example, are happy when they're skiing or working in their garden or making love or driving their sports car or whatever is happy making for them, but they're doing something, their energy is outgoing. Diet and quiet are the yin doctors when we're eating, we're bringing things in to nourish and energize our body. And when we're resting, we're bringing life force energy in to energize our body. So in general, happiness and movement are outward going yang, diet and quiet are inward going yin principles. 
So with that said, let's take a brief look. Dr. Happiness is correlated with the air element. The air element is very much linked to our mind and our thinking processes and is coupled with the warmth element to produce conscious thought. Uh, dead people are cold and they're not breathing, so there's no thinking or awareness left in that body. So with Dr. Happy, we need to use our mind in order to get clear what we love enough to heal for and grow for and be motivated to become more aware of what is it that's stopping us from living fully and expressing our creativity and being able to forgive and move on. Dr. Happiness is linked to the season spring and spring is the season of planning. Whenever we start a new project or we're gonna go on a road trip or begin a project, there is generally the need for some kind of planning so that we can basically map out how we're going to apply our energy, how we're gonna acquire the resources, where we're gonna need financial support, when are we going to work, when are we going to rest, these types of things. So if we don't have a sense of plan, it's as though we're heading off to try to go somewhere, but we don't really know how we're going to get there, which increases the likelihood of a lot of sidetracking and energy depletion. So Dr. Happy is the domain of getting clear what is happy making. Most people don't actually understand without spending some time what is happy making. They just know what's not happy making for them. So when it comes to core values for Dr. Happy, the first thing we have to do is say, what is happy making for me? And to the degree that we need healing, we've often lost track of what is happy making and therefore we're tend to be oriented toward what we don't want all the time, and that's living out our fears, which is often false evidence appearing real. So we tend to project things into our environment. I'm always going to be broke. Nobody loves me. I'll never have enough. No one will hire me, which is, you know, very, very um, un-doctor happy. It's, but it's uh, very, very powerful. <laughs> as I shared with you with Arnold Patton's universal principles, if we don't like what's happening in our life, look carefully at what we're choosing unconsciously. So these are very important concepts. Once we know what's happy making for us and we have a plan, we move into doctor movement, which is the element of fire. Fire is what moves things into action. And this is the element of summer. When the sun is high, that's when our cortisol levels are the highest. That's the time of the year when we have long days, and that's when we generally get the most done. So we can look at this as a daily cycle, but we can also look at it as an annual cycle, or we can look at it as a cycle that any activity unfolds within. So here we are taking our plan and we're executing it, and because we have a plan that tells us when we should be resting, when we should be exercising or working, and how much we should be doing so that we consciously acknowledge our need for adequate times for meals, adequate times for rest, adequate times for self-time, spiritual development, social time with family, friends, whatever is essential to you feeling whole. Then we put that into action and it ultimately becomes meaningful. Dr. Diet links to the earth element. That means making something tangible. So I put it into action. I take the idea, the dream, put it into action, and it produces a tangible result. It might be at the end of the day saying, wow, I really feel good because I accomplished such and such today. And fall is the season of celebration and harvest. So at the end of the day, even though you may be only two days into a project, if you've knocked off your goals and objectives, or you've done some good introspective work to move progressively towards resolution of your healing challenge, then at the end of the day, you want to give forgiveness to those that need forgiveness, including yourself, and you want to give gratitude for all that you have and find ways to celebrate the completion of a beautiful 
day of moving toward your dream. Now, for each of you, that has to be individual. For some, it might be uh, vaporizing some pot. For others, it might be ice cream. For others, it might be uh, a glass of wine. Uh, it really less matters what it is, but more matters if you use it in the context of celebrating healthy movement in the direction of resolution. But most people drink the wine and smoke the pot and eat the garbage all day long and then just complain about how shitty their life is. So we have to put, you know, the cart in front of the, or the horse in front of the cart, so to speak. So here we're also looking carefully at what we're eating. Here we're looking at our mental, emotional aspects of how we're, what's important to us and how we're going to map it out and, and then how we're going to do it. And this includes movement of the body, not just movement of the day. And here we are looking at the earth, which is when we're harvesting, we're bringing things in. We eat foods that have been harvested. So we have to pay close attention to how is our body responding to the foods and the drinks. And if you're having any kind of health challenge, it's very essential to write down everything that goes into your body and all the symptoms that you're having so that within as little as a week, you can start to see patterns. Every time I drink coffee, this happens to me. Every time I eat chicken, this happens to me. Every time I eat nuts, grains, seeds, dairy, dot, 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 I start to see that there's a reaction that happens in pattern. And using the four-day rotation diet in my book allows you to segregate those things so that you're eating foods from separate genus so that you're not constantly reacting to the same thing, which would confuse the pattern. So you can read about that in the book. Dr. Quiet relates to winter. We need a line there. The element is water, which links directly to our emotions energetically. The season is winter, which links to rest. So we plan, we achieve, we celebrate and conclude our day and we go into rest. Now, sometimes we have to intersperse doctor movement and doctor quiet, just like when you're in the gym, you can't just keep the fire on all the time. You have to do a set rest. So fire antagonizes water and they work together in, as complementary opposites. So here we have to give ourselves time to let go of the world. Uh, sometimes it helps to do a prayer of thanks to Great Spirit or to Mother Earth and, and celebrate the end of a day and doing the best you could do and say, thank you, Mother Earth, for carrying the weight of my obligations or the weight of my responsibilities or the weight of my pain. Sometimes I have people write what worries them down, put it into what I call a worry box, and once they put it into the worry box, they promise to let it go until the next day when they can engage it and integrate it into the process. Here we also need to be aware of our emotions because our emotions are actually generally more powerful than our thoughts for reasons that are too technical for me to get into right now. So we have our love. We have two forces to balance. Am I overthinking or underthinking? Am I over moving or under moving? Am I over eating or under eating? And that might be over consuming or under consuming water. That might be over eating or under eating flesh foods or over eating or under eating plant foods or over or under eating uh, simple carbohydrates, processed foods, etc. Am I over resting, i.e. not participating or am I under resting because I'm all fire and no rest, which leads to burnout and usually anxiety leading to depression. Then we have to make three choices. The optimal, the suboptimal, or do nothing. The optimal choice is the one that's best for you and everybody on your dream team. The suboptimal gives instant gratification, but usually in some way slows you down or causes stress on your dream team. Doing nothing, if you don't know what you, don't have the information you need to make a good decision, then calling a timeout and gathering the information is an effective use of doing nothing. If you're in a heated emotional engagement and you can feel you're getting further and further away from the person and less connected at the heart, calling a timeout 
and saying, look, I can feel that we're getting further and further away, not closer together. I need time to gather myself. I will return to this conversation when I, can feel, when I feel I can add meaningfully to it, and walking away would be the effective use of doing nothing. But to not participate or to be apathetic is a dangerous choice because it's the equal of repression or denial and the rot just continues to um, degenerate you and, and the whole situation. So one love, two forces, three choices, four doctors, look at your food and drink. Pay attention to where your triggers are. Oftentimes, you have a long list of, oh, when you talk to me like that, it frustrates me because, and it might remind you of how your dad treated you or how your mother treated you or how a school teacher treated you. But those triggers are really where our most easy access healing is because we know that that's something that bothers us. And when we have healed the trigger, it doesn't wind us up anymore. We actually have empathy because we can see that there was a time when that really bothered us and we now understand it. So we have empathy. We can say, okay, that person's probably suffering from such and such because I recognize the signs and symptoms of someone who doesn't feel loved or is overworked or uh, financially stressed. And I used to be one of those people too. So you can have empathy and compassion for people like that instead of being reactive. So our triggers are really easy access doorways to where our healing is. <clears throat> and the most important thing to remember when you're triggered is that everybody is loving the best they can. We all love the best we can with the training and the awareness that we have and with the upbringing that we had. And part of being aware is recognizing where it's now your turn to grow. Mom and dad did the best they could. School teachers did the best they could. But an adult takes responsibility for themselves and moves forward to finish the job of their own evolution and their own creation and takes responsibility for what they grow within themselves. And one of the greatest ways to begin healing is simply recognize everyone was loving the best that they could. And now is our chance to evolve our family or evolve in general so that we can take advantage of this opportunity of heightened awareness. When the pain teacher shows up, it's a gift of awareness. We can now capitalize on the fact that we can see where our weeds are growing and do the work to pull them out by the roots. Now, uh, some awareness training that's very simple. This comes from the Christian contemplatives. If you just sit and go get relaxed and go into meditation and try to focus your mind only on the numbers one through ten and simply just count inside of yourself one two three four and every time a thought jumps into your head you start over again and you realize you've lost awareness. Very simple exercise, and it works for sure if you practice it. So focus one, two, three, and if all of a sudden, oh shit, I forgot to unlock the front door, or I gotta remember, whatever it is, you go back to one. Don't worry, I've heard Monks say that they've been doing it for 30 years and they're lucky if they get past four, but that's the, the key issue is continuing to practice. And so it teaches you how to bring your mind to be fully present with what you're doing, which is counting from one to 10. Many people want some fancy dancy, high tech, spiritual, modern, new age, magic shit, when really, if you just learn to count to 10, and not lose your train of thought, you'll already be ahead of 99.99% of the people on the planet. Now in closing, when people would see Carl Jung with chronic challenges in their life or health problems, he would ask them, what is your unmet task? Inevitably, he saw over and over again that where people were wriggling and wiggling and complaining and bitching and blaming and poor me, if only, I woulda, shoulda, coulda, didn't. 
there was inevitably an unmet task. That task might be forgiving yourself. It might be accepting that everyone's loving the best they can and doing your best to love yourself and others the best you can. It might be to forgive others that have harmed you. It might be to ask for forgiveness from people who you've been rude or abusive to. But there's an unmet task very frequently when there's a need for healing. And it's our work to become honest and congruent with ourselves to determine what the unmet task is and resolve it. And that often frees up enough energy to heal about anything and makes us more conscious. Steiner felt that whenever there was a person with a chronic health problem, such as a disease or any chronic degenerative condition, irritable bowel syndrome, those types of things, that there was a secret story that they were telling themselves. And he felt that if we work with them as doctors, therapists, and help them identify what their secret story was, that they would begin to heal. And you'll see that interestingly, Jung and Steiner, who were out in the world at the same time, but didn't have a lot of contact with each other, came to the very similar realizations. The unmet task is usually linked to your secret story. And your secret story is the story that you're telling yourself, but may actually be unconscious that you're telling until you put some awareness and see what are the justifications and the excuses that you make within yourself that are stopping you from living your one love or your dream. So that's my short lesson on awareness today. I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll come back in our next segment and we will talk about anger for better or for worse when it comes to healing. So thank you for joining me today. I'm Paul Check. Check out our HLC1 online program. That qualifies you to come into our Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 2 to learn how to do this with a lot more tools and go a lot deeper, both for yourself and the many people in the world who could really use some good holistic healing today. You can also look at my Check 4 Quadrant Coaching Mastery, which gets quite deep into the archetypes that uh, need healing in most all of us, which is the survival archetypes, the, the Imago Dei, image of deity, mother, father, and child. So thanks for joining me. Look forward to sharing with you soon.